Good morning. What's up, Neon Life Church? How you guys doing? Feel good? All right. Well, it's good to see you guys today. Uh, as always, I love to just take a minute and, and just talk to you online. If you're watching us through these cameras, then I'm so glad that you are along for the ride. I want to just encourage you to let God do a powerful work in your life today. Uh, I know you're cozy right now on that, on that sofa or wherever you are right now, but don't get so cozy that you kind of tune out what God wants to do because God wants to do a transformational work in you today, so let him do it. And, uh, and you too, don't get so cozy in these, these chairs, everybody. You don't let God do a powerful work. Can we commit to that today, everybody? We're going to let God do a powerful work. Come on, everybody. We're going to do it. Let's let him do a work in us. I think that uh, there's just nothing better than... You know, you, you're, you're here. You guys look fantastic. And Keith, it is, it, is, it is good to see you, brother. Man, I'm telling you. I love you. I'm praying for, I pray every day. We, there's so many praying for you, and we love you so much. Man, it's good to see you. Uh, so, all right. Um, sorry, I got distracted by that. I'm just, I just love you, man. And, uh, and so if you're here today, I just want to just invite you guys to, you know, you, you look great, you're here. Let God do a powerful work in you. And I, I think that's always so important that uh, anytime you, you, you're in um, uh, an atmosphere like this, uh, that, that you, you come uh, expecting, but you come uh, just open, wide open to God. And there's nothing better than just being like, just God, I, I just, I just, I want to receive this word today. God, would you, would, would you let me hear something? Let my spirit just take something in that I can leave today where it's just transformational for me. And, and that's my prayer for you every single Sunday. We, we pray, we gather together. As a matter of fact, every single Saturday from 1030 to 1130. And, uh, and jokingly yesterday, it was kind of almost a little bit, you had to laugh because um, we, had our, we had our men's breakfast yesterday, which was phenomenal, by the way. And Sean, thank you, sir, and your team for putting together a great men's breakfast. And, uh, but it, it, it just kind of happened like right in the middle of our, of our typical, of our Saturday setup, which we, we're going to make plans in the future for to work around things like that. Um, but we get here, and so we're kind of running around, scattered, things, things are everywhere. And, uh, and so we, we have like maybe 30% of everything set up and 1030 hits and, and I just see everybody kind of dropping stuff. And then they, we come into this room and we, and we come in here for a moment of worship and a, a moment of the word. And then we just go after God in prayer. And I just love that heart. And, uh, I just, I shared a story in, uh, in, in the gospel of Luke, um, I believe. And it's the story of Mary and Martha where, uh, Martha, Jesus comes and visits uh, Mary and Martha at their home, and Martha is scurrying around uh, trying to clean up and pick up because here's Jesus, he's here, and, 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 and Jesus says, says, Martha, you're concerned about a whole lot of things that aren't important, but there's one thing that is important, and Mary, you see her just at the feet of Jesus, just, just taking that moment in, and I, I just love the heart of this church, that that's the heart of this church, that we know when there's a time to serve and get, and get busy, um, but we also know when there's a time to just, just get um, open and transparent with God. That's my hope for you today. So if, if you would do that, I promise you, your life will be changed if you'll just let God, let God do a powerful work in you because he wants to do it. He's there. Um, next Saturday or this coming Saturday, uh, we have our growth track class. So for those of you that's looking to know more about Neon Life Church, uh, kind of look under the hood, kick the tires a little bit, check us out, uh, see where you can get connected and, and what the vision of Neon Life, and really, I don't even say it that way. I say what the vision is of God for your life uh, here at this church um, looks like, and so we go through that. That is this coming Saturday, uh, and you can sign up if you're online. You can sign up online and fill out a connection card and do all those things online uh, if you're watching through the camera, uh, or you can do that too, um, or you can take the connection card there in your seat back and fill that out. And then um, just a few weeks away, we are, we are getting geared up for our spring semester of life groups, everybody. Like spring is coming, everybody. How many of you are ready? <laughs> this year is, is rolling quick. I don't know if you know that or not, but, but we, we are not stopping. And so we're moving right ahead. And I'm excited about this year. And, uh, and so if you're a life group leader, um, I pray that God stirs your heart. Um, to, to go on our website, go on our groups page and get your group um, set up there. And if maybe you haven't ever led a group before, so you want to be a first time life group leader, um, there's a process for you too on our website on the life group page, neonlifepeople.com slash groups, um, first time leader application, fill that out. We, 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 the heart for our life groups are very simple because we believe 
And the, 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 we believe in people finding freedom through the power of just healthy relationships. So that's our focus. We just say, like, if you can open up a, 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 some Dr. Pepper and some Doritos, like, you can have an environment where, where life change happens because it's not about the curriculum, everybody. It is, it is about the relationships that are being formed and made in, in, the, in, these, in these life groups. And so it is the way that we are able as a church to care for you um, the people, because I, I would love to be able to pastor every single one of you uh, individually, but I can't. It, it'd be literally impossible. And the way that we do that is through our through our life group. So we care for you better through groups. So I want to invite you, if you're not leading a group, to be to get in a group. So February 11th, if you've never been to one of our life group Sundays, you don't want to miss it because it's always a party around here. So we like to treat you guys big and um, kind of roll out the red car- carpet, so to speak, and, and, and we treat you all. So don't want to miss it. It's always going to be good. And that's coming up on February the 11th. All right. So I want to jump into the, today's message. It's week four of the series that we are just going into 2024 with, with this um, just banner just over us. It just says, get your hopes up. Because when you get your hopes up, it actually gives your faith a place to go. And it actually brings life and excitement into your faith. We just, um, actually, matter of fact, today, we close out our 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you don't know what that is, I encourage you, come August, we're going to have 21 days of prayer Well, in January, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting, and in August, I say 21 days of prayer and feasting, everybody. We don't incorporate the fasting. You can if you want to, Um, but uh, I invite you guys to to get on that, um, to go deeper with God and get get in that journey with God where I believe God calls us in these seasons, and, uh, and this year was kind of different for me for 21 days of prayer and fasting. Every single year, I'm always very methodical about my approach to my my, my season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I always go into it with, um, with a, like a, like almost like a game plan of what I'm gonna do and, and my, my prayer list. And so I, I know, and, and this, is, this is how it looks. Because I'm, I'm a very methodical person. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, I love, I love taking notes. I love having notes. Like I have to-do lists. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you look at my phone, my to-do list is like super duper long and I'm, that's always what kind of keeps me uh, focused. And, uh, and so I kind of go into my prayer time like that. But this season, I decided to do things differently. I decided to... Um, to just spend time with God during my prayer time. Like God, I don't, I don't even, I barely even really got to the place where I just asked God for anything. And it's, it's not like me. I mean, usually I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll go to God, I'll get into his presence and I'll, I'll, I'll always like have a process where I'm like, thank you, God, you're such a good father and I worship you and, and you're so good in my life. And I start thanking him for so many things and, and I'm like, and God, you know, if you just answer some prayers and, I, and that's kind of my prayer time. But this time it was like, God, I just want to come and just, just sit at your feet. Like, I just want to be in your presence during this season. God, I just need, I was, my prayer was, God, I need just, just, a, just a refreshing in my faith. And I didn't even go for any other thing other than I spent so much time just worshiping God. You know, I just spent so much time just getting into the presence of God. And, and it's so important that you, that you do that, that you, you never forsake that presence moment with God. And, and, and you, I can't hardly explain how to do that. I was having a conversation last week with someone close to me, and, and we, were, we started talking about this, just how to, how to, how to get into the presence of God. And I, just, I, just, I said, you know, um, what if you tried going at God a different way? Kind of like what I was doing in my 21 days of prayer and fasting. I wasn't coming at him the same way. What if you try to go at God a different way, like change it up a little bit, like make it fresh, make it new, you know, because I know this might sound a little bit crazy and kooky to you, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you me. I learned this um, through some freedom ministry training that, that Crystal and I have gone through that you, you literally envision um, like, like talking and speaking with God, like a, like, like a literal location, um, and they actually, some of their thoughts was like at the, you know, on a, on, a, on a peaceful lake, on a dock, you know, you're sitting, just you and God, and you're having this conversation. Well, that's not me. This is, this is, this is what I see. My, mine is, a, is an old white farmhouse in the middle of the woods. And, and the old white farmhouse even has some paint chipping off of it. I don't even know, don't ask me why, it's just there. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make that up. That's just, 
That's just when I, when I, when I approach God, that's, and I see God up these, they're, they're just wide stairs. Like the stairs are like really wide and they're, the, the wood on it's like a gray wood, you know, so it's, it's kind of like old wood and, and there's God. He's on, he's on the, like the door is here. God is literally sitting here in a rocking chair. I mean, I, this, is, and this is how I, and when I approach him, I just approach him that way. And, uh, and it's always been great for me because I, it's like I come out of the woods and I walk up the steps and there's God right there, my father, and he's so happy and excited to see me. And so me and him just have a conversation and it just helps me get into the presence of God. But my thought was this, is what if, what if you don't go up the front steps in, in, when, you, when you approach God? What if you went, because the, the house might have a kitchen door. Like that goes from the out, you know, like an old farmhouse, like they got doors everywhere in these farmhouses, right? Because they got to let the air, has to let in, in and out, you know, they didn't have air conditioning back in the day. And so, um, and, uh, and so you walk in the side door and, and you're still going to, you're still approaching God, but man, it's a different view. Like, wow, this is the kitchen. I mean, I've never been through this way. I mean, and so it's so important that you just find a way where you position your life in such a way to get in the, and be in the presence of God. And, and, and I can't even, I can't tell you how to do it other than just open your life up to the, the goodness of who God is. And it's, it's just, there's just no other way for me to explain it than just, than just literally, just physically just say, God, I am all yours. I think the most powerful thing that we can do, because we're control freaks, is to let, 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 let your control go. Relinquish control to God. Like, just relinquish it. Surrender it all and just say, God, I give it all to you. And I'm trusting you. And it's just like a full, open, like spiritually, I'm opening my life up to you. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to help you out because it's so important that you're able to connect with, 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 our, with a good father and be in the presence of God. And I'll, and I'll show you why. When it comes to getting our hopes up and it comes to pursuing God for things in your faith that are, that are impossible and far beyond you, um, I'll show you why the presence of God is... is, is not just vital, but I believe it's required in it. And it's in Acts chapter 2. So Acts is a book. You have, you have the four Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have the book of Acts. Acts is actually a, a portion of the Gospels. It's a historical book about um, how the, the believers built the, the first church, like the early church. And so you can imagine like all the different problems they, would fa they faced in building the church. So um, what they would need is the Holy Spirit to actually do what they needed to do. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said, he said, if I don't leave you, if I don't go and die on the cross for all mankind, then the, then the advocate, the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit cannot come and be with you. And believe me, you want him in your life. And so it starts in Acts chapter 2. It says first, it says, then Peter stood up. And so, uh, which to me, like, think about that for just a moment. Peter, like this dude in the Gospels, was, he was the guy getting rebuked by Jesus, cutting off ears, uh, denying Jesus. He couldn't even, he, to a little girl, he couldn't even stand up to a little girl and say that, yes, I know, I know this man being crucified. He denied Jesus at the cross. This is the same Peter. Had a campfire come to, like, literal come to Jesus meeting next to a campfire after he did it all. Like, he was so remorseful about the way he lived his life. We get into Acts chapter 2, literally only about probably 60 days after he has just denied Jesus at the cross, like 50, 60 days, probably right around in that time frame. And, and Peter stands up. The only differing factor from then to him denying Jesus at the cross to actually standing up and being bold for Christ, there's only one thing that changed. And it is, it is the Holy Spirit. That's it. And that's my hope for you. My prayer for you is that you would open up your life to the power of the Holy Spirit and let him in. Like it, and and it, it transforms us. So it says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven and, and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. He said, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain something to you. That's how I read the Bible, by the way. He said, Listen carefully to what I say. These people, they're not drunk like you think that they are. Um, actually, I just, as you suppose, it's only nine in the morning. So there were some things going on that, that they didn't understand. So Peter had to like kind of clear some things up with them. He said, no, this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then Peter goes on to actually give a prophetic, uh, a prophecy that was, um, uh, that was by Joel. It says in the last days, which by the way, I believe we're in the first, the first days of the last day. 
I believe we're in the last days. You look around and you read the gospel and you, and you, and you have a closest to God, you could see that we are, I believe we are in the last days. God says, I'm going to do this in the last days. He says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. And by the way, I want, you to, I want you to grab hold of that because God's presence and what God wants to do in your life isn't just for select people. Like God's power and God's authority and what God wants to do in your life, the way God wants to move in your life is no different than what he wants to do in my life. Like I'm no more special than you are to God. Like God wants to pour out his spirit on every single person. And he says, your sons and your daughters they're going to prophesy. You're, now, notice that all three of these things are things that haven't happened yet, right? So they, they see them, but they're things that haven't come to fruition. and not, They're not anything that's even actually happened yet, but people are going to see it, right? So they're going to prophesy. Your young men are going to see visions. I'm seeing visions, by the way, just, just to clear that one up. Your old men, I'm not dreaming dreams yet. Some of you might be there dreaming dreams. That's all right. I'll get there one day says that your old men are going to dream dreams. So every single one of these are things that haven't happened yet, but, the, but because the Spirit was poured out on them, they were actually able to see something. Now, I want you to grab hold of this. The main job of the Holy Spirit is to help you see things the way that God sees them. So the Holy Spirit wants you to see your life the way God sees your life. The Holy Spirit wants you to see your finances the way God sees your finances. The Holy Spirit wants you to see um, your neighborhood your city, your world, your circumstances, your problems, all these different areas of your life, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to see our life the same way that God sees it. And the Holy Spirit wants to show you things that haven't happened yet. And here's what I want you to grab hold of. If you could see these things, when the Holy Spirit reveals them to you, He knows that if you could see them, you'll want to go after them. So, what the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit actually gives you a place to run in your faith, a target for your faith. I talked about this a little bit last week, but today I want to address this with, with this message. It's, it's just you need a target for your faith. You need a place that you can go with your faith. It says, even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And then he says, I will show you. So God wants you to see some things. He says, I'll show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, which is our entire motivation for getting our hopes up. I want to tell you that, that our entire motivation for getting your hopes up is that lives will be changed through it. God's motivation for doing a work in your life is that lives would be changed through it. God never does a selfish work. But God's work is always something to transform us and do a work inside of us and also transform others. That God always wants to do a powerful work in us. And my absolute greatest hope for you as your pastor is that you would let the Holy Spirit in so that he can reveal some things in your life because he knows that if he can reveal them to you, you'll want to go after them. It becomes a target for your faith, a place for your faith to run to. Proverbs 13 and 12 says, hope deferred. So whenever I, whenever I don't have a target for my faith, my faith has nowhere to run to, it says, makes the heart sick. So when you have nothing to hope for, nothing to believe God for, you're not trusting God for anything, then, it, then, then you, your faith actually, you feel it in your faith. And some of you feel that. Like you, your hearts get sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Like we go running to God. And so for some of you, this is like mission critical. Like you're in a place today where you're, you're kind of going through the motions in your faith. And it's, it's, your faith has become stagnant, monotonous, dull, boring, even dead. And so you come in here and you, might, you know the songs and you lift your hands and it's like, but on the inside it's like, God, I just don't feel you. And the reason why is because you don't have a target for your faith the size of our God. You need a target for your faith that supersedes your abilities, that says it's impossible you need, you need a target for your faith that is just like laughable, like ridiculous, like there's no way that's ever going to happen within your own abilities. Hebrews 12 and 1 says that faith is the substance of things that I am hoping for, but the evidence of things that I haven't seen yet. 
And so what the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit actually gives you the ability to see some things that you haven't seen, that haven't happened yet. They're impossible. You can't do it on your own strength, but because now you can see them, it actually gives your faith a place to run to, and it actually makes your faith tangible, like it's the substance of our faith, like your, your faith actually becomes something that's real. And it's alive. And that's my hope for you, that your faith would actually come alive and be tangible and like a substance. Like it's, it's, it's like, I, I, just, I hope that you guys step into a place in your faith that you've never been before. Like your faith comes alive in ways it's never come alive before. So how do we do that? Like how do we, uh, how do we get our faith moving in the right direction? Well, you need a target for your faith. So there's five types of people, and I want to give you those five types of people today. And the first type of person is the person that has no target at all. Now, you can feel this one, and this one may be you today. Like, you may be here today, and you just, you feel like you're, you're like, you don't, you're not even concerned about what's next. You're just like, my faith just feels dead, and my faith feels incredibly empty, Almost as if, like if I could paint you a picture of what it feels like to just not have a target at all, it's almost as if you feel like you're just trying to tread water in your, in your, in your Christianity, and it's just like you're just kind of keeping your head above water, and this is just too complicated. And that's because you don't have a target big enough for the size of our God. And so I kind of thought, well, well, how big is God? Like, how big is God? So Job, actually, one of the oldest books in the Bible, Job actually ask this question like we know the story of Job he loses everything and he finds himself in this place with God where he looks up to heaven and he asks this question in Job 11 he said can anyone fathom the mysteries of God could anyone know the limits of the almighty they're higher than the heavens above what can you do they're deeper than the depths below what can you know his measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea so I think what Job would say is, is God is bigger than your circumstances. He's bigger than your problems. He's bigger than your addictions. He's bigger than all these things that you're, that you're, that you're thinking. This is totally impossible. God is bigger than the doctor's report that you just got. God is bigger than all these things that you just got to get your hopes up and believe that he is. I mean, if you imagine, yeah, come on, everybody. If you want to give him praise, give him praise. I heard, I heard a couple of like light claps, like, come on, give it up. Not for me, for him, but... Um, if you think about God creating everything, like one of the things that blows my mind is like God created the, the trees and the animals and the, and the stars and, the, and he, put the, he put the stars in their, in their places and he, and he put the moon where it is and he put the sun where it is. And then he created, the Bible says, the expanses of the universe. Like we don't even know the depths of the ocean. We don't even know the expanse of the universe yet. God holds every single bit of it in the palm of his hand. That's how big our God is. David even said this in uh, Psalm 145 and 3. He said, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness, no one can fathom. So what do I do? The Bible is clear. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says this. He says, God says, call to me. Like God is saying, just come close to me. Like Come close to me and I'll, I'll answer you, he says, and I'll show you great and mighty things that you didn't see before, like that you don't know, because he knows once you see them, you'll want to go after him. So how do you get close to God? I'm going to just give you something practical here, because I think a lot of times when we go to God in prayer, we spend all of our effort and all of our energy trying to get up to God, like, like God is this, this big guy on a, on a throne up in heaven and we got to get all of our energy together and, 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 and we, gotta, we need to get up to where God is. And if, we, and if we've made it, this is what makes it worse, when we've made a mistake or we've messed up and we, we've slipped up and done something we know we shouldn't have done, well, it makes it more difficult for us to get up to God because we're trying to climb up to where he's at. Can I tell you something? The Bible says that your righteousness is like filthy rags to God. You know what God wants? God doesn't want us to come up to him. God wants an invitation for him to come down to us. That's all God's looking for. It's that simple. God's not saying, I want you to come to where I am. Like, I'm, I'm this loft, I'm, I'm the lofty creator, the king of everything. Like, you want to you talk to me? Come to me. That's not what God said. God wanted so badly 
to come down to where you are. He sent his only son to die on a cross so that he could do that. That's how bad God wants to just step into your life. And all God needs, the only thing God needs is an invitation from you to do that. God just says, I just need to be invited. Like Bible says, God says, if you'll draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. God says, all I'm needing is an invitation. And the moment God gets that invitation, it's like, he's ready. Like, that's all God wants from you. Here's the second thing, is uh, it's, it's people with a wrong target. Like, you're aiming at a target, but you're, you're, you're aiming at the wrong one. It's, it's, it, and this, this is what you need to grab hold of. It might be a good target. It might even be um, a, uh, a target that looks like something God would want, Right? but it's not a God target. There's a book I've read. I've actually read it three times. It's by John Bevere. It's called Good or God, and that's a great book. Actually, I've read it three times because it gets my faith in check every single time. And, uh, but it asks the question, is what I'm doing something good or is it something God? Like, is, is this just something I'm doing or for whatever reason or is this actually something God has called me to? And it's a good question to ask. Because a lot of times we spin our tires on the wrong thing. We're shooting at the wrong target. And God says, I want you to shoot at the right target. There's a, in 2004, uh, at the, uh, at the Summer Olympics, there was a a famous target shooter named Matthew Edmonds, world champion, number one target shooter. Actually, during this time, he was the number one target shooter in the world. They come to the last round of the Olympics. Like, this is the gold medal round right here. Matthew Edmonds comes up to the last target. And all he has to do is hit the target, anywhere on the target. Like, it doesn't matter where, just hit the target, and he wins the Olympics, the gold medal. Gets up to the last target, he aims, and he shoots, hits the bullseye on the wrong target. He went from first place to eighth place like that. And I found myself asking this question about that. Like, how many of us do that? How many of us are are literally shooting, aiming, hitting the bullseye, but we're hitting the bullseye on the on the wrong target and we're putting so much energy and so much effort into like the wrong things like like more money uh, a a better job a bigger house a new a new car I mean that's those things are all great there's nothing wrong with those things but those are all things to live on you need something to live for like you were made for more everybody like God made you created you like to believe in him for the impossible, for more than just those things. It's not about having riches here on earth and having your life fulfilled here on earth. I know, I get it. You want, you think that money's gonna solve your problem. Money ain't gonna solve your problem. More money, more problems, everybody. I'm telling you, it's the truth. Now, ain't nothing wrong with God blessing us because God wants to bless us. But it's never about what God's doing out here because what God is worried about and focused on is God is focused on doing an an eternal work. He wants to do a work inside here. So every time God does a work in your life, when when, when you see the miracles of God, guess where it happens at? It happens on the inside. Like That's not to say that he won't do things out here, but God is focused on the inside of our life. I think that a a, a good psalm that 37 and 4, we put this on our, like it's our refrigerator verse. Like, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give me the desires of my heart. Oh, thank you, God. That's so wonderful. I get all the desires that I want. I get that new car and that bigger paycheck, and that may be true, but but read the verse. The verse says, delight yourself in the Lord. That word delight in the Hebrew actually means to be tender and pliable. And so if you're going to delight yourself in God, guess what you have to become? Tender towards God. And, and shapeable, pliable with God. And the re- I, I'll tell you, the reason why God wants you to be pliable, because whenever you start believing God for the impossible, you better be pliable with God. Because God is going to do things, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, you're going to want to give up, and you've got to be flexible with God. That's one thing I have learned about Neon Life Church. I walked into this, I used to be, I'm not near as rigid, I'm still a little bit rigid, um, like, like T's crossed and I's dotted and that's me and, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm very meticulous and methodical and uh, I have notes and I have notes for notes and so, um, but I had to let a lot of that stuff go whenever we came into this church launch. I had to realize that, man, things are gonna get, TVs are gonna hit the ground and shatter. Like there's gonna be things that are gonna happen and I'm just gonna have to be like, oh man, it's okay, we'll get another one. Like we've had to do that. Like 
we'll come in here and all, we'll come down the hall and somebody just, boom, there goes the television set and it shatters. I'm like, hey, it ain't no big deal. We'll go down to Best Buy and buy another one. Like, that's just, and then I'm just telling you, you just gotta be, and I'm, I'm just using that example, but you've gotta be pliable with God and let God do a work. And what happens whenever you become tender and pliable with God, this transformation takes place where no longer is it your desires you want, but now this transformation happens where, God, I want what you want. So God gives you the desires of your heart, but first, it's like, man, I've got close to him and I'm trusting him and, and those desires actually change and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's better, everybody. Here's the third one right here. It's a stale target. So you have a target, but you've just lost hope. And for whatever reason, maybe it's because it just, it's just been too long. Like I'm tired, I'm tired of, of waiting on this and you may not want to hear this, but I go through seasons like this. Like I go through seasons where, God, it's been a long time. Like a church building, Lord, like I, I think we're in year four of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Like literally four years now, I've been praying like every day for, a, for God, would you bless us with a building? And I'm, and I'm telling you, I've wrestled with this because I get to a place where I'm like, you know, maybe this is just never going to happen. And I'm just going to tell you today to get your hopes up. Like I think that, I think that oftentimes what we do is we just think, well, well, time is our greatest enemy. Well, God is not restricted by what we're restricted by. God ain't restricted by time, everybody. He's not restricted by your pocketbook. He's not restricted by your finances. God is, your finances do not determine what God can do in your life or can't do. Your wisdom and abilities or inabilities does not determine what God can or can't do in your life. So get your hopes up, everybody, because God wants to bless you. Matthew 19, 26, just a reminder, with man, it's impossible. In your strength, it's impossible. It may seem like it's never going to happen. Uh, this, it's just too much time has gone by. With man, this all seems impossible. But with God, all things. All things are possible. I like this verse right here in Isaiah 57, 15. I want you to have this one. If you've lost hope, I want you to hear this. For this is what the high and exalted one says. This is what God says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, he says, I live in a high and unholy place, but also I live with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive that spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And I pray you'd let God do that. Here's the fourth one right here. And it's a vague target. Like, you know, you have a God target, but it just is vague to you. It's not clear. And if there's one thing, this is very practical, that will help you have a clear God target. When God gives you a target, what will give you clarity, it's this right here, write it down. Like, write down the target. Write down what God is telling you. Like, write it down. Like, literally, when God speaks something to you, write it down, take it to God in prayer, pray over it, and you might be like, okay, well, that was just a taco cost I had the night before. Or you're like, God... You're stirring my heart for this, and, and now you're stirring my faith for it, and now it gives me a place to run to. As a matter of fact, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2, God gave Habakkuk a word, and this is what God told Habakkuk to do. He said, Habakkuk, write down the vision and inscribe it clearly on tablets so that the one who reads it may run. Whenever you have a target for your faith, it gives you a place to run to. If the target's vague, write it down, rehearse it, pray over it. Like just, just it, it, because life gets distracting and it gives you, it kind of gets everything back together. So there's those of us that have no target, a wrong target, a stale target, and a vague target. But you want to know what the right target is? It's this one right here. It's the fifth one. It's a God-honoring, culture-defying, heaven-impacting, seemingly impossible target. I want to give them all to you one at a time. Here's the first one, a God-honoring target. I, like, I want, I want... I am so grateful for all that God has done and all the many blessings God has done, but I want everything in my life to point to God and God alone. I don't want anything to be about me. I don't want, as a matter of fact, I mean, literally, um, Crystal and I have actually talked about it. Like, you, and this is not picking on any churches that do this because you see pastors that their faces on the billboards. You will never see this mug on a billboard for Neon Life Church 
ever. Like, I promise you. Like, I, and there's, whatever other churches do, that's fine. That's their vision. That's their heart. But I'm going to tell you the heart of this church is I don't want anything ever attributed to, pointed to me. I don't get any credit for any of this. God gets all the glory for everything that happens here in Jesus' name. Yeah. Can I get an amen for that? Come on. The next one is a culture-defying target. There is no way, I'm, I'm rebellious enough to not let culture define what my God is capable of. It's, and, it's, and it's interesting to me because if, if, if it can't, if, if, it, if I'm told it can't be done, I, it just stirs me that much more. Like, tell me something, if you want me to go after something that, that God wants me to have, tell me, tell me it's impossible. Tell me it can't be done. Tell me there's no way it's ever going to happen. It fires me up. Like, I, I get fired up just thinking about these culture-defying figures like men and women of the past. Billy Graham, I'm, I, I, mean, I love watching. This guy can get up on a stage and just literally quote John 3.16 and 50,000 people come rushing down to receive Jesus. Why is that? Because God has put a vision in his heart and he's following it faithfully. I mean, look at that. He, it's, 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 when he says John 3.16, I want to get saved again. Like, I'm like, are you serious? Like, he's so passionate about the vision that God has given him. He has a target for his faith. And God wants you to have that in spite of what culture says. Like, it's culture-defying. I want a heaven-impacting target. I want at the end of my life's work to be eternal. I'm not storing up treasures here on earth. I'm storing up treasures in heaven. I mean, like I want at the end of my life, I want to get to heaven and, and, and I just want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to get to heaven and just, like, I don't want to just like barely get into heaven. I want to just, I want to slide into heaven like risky business. I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not my underwear or nothing, but I don't know what we're going to be wearing. That was a weird, that was a weird illustration. <laughs> I've never, I've I'm not going to say I've never seen the movie. I wasn't saved my whole life, everybody. Give me a break. Let's move on. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. Y'all, sometimes I don't like myself. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Heaven impacting target. Like, I just, I want it. I want everything we do to be eternal. I want to invest in eternity. I, wanna, I want us to, man, let's put our, let's put, all of our energy, all of our efforts, all of our time, our talents, our finances into in the, the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, you want to you invest in something that, that, that just gives you a, 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 just a reward, it's heaven. It's just eternal. And then the last one is a seemingly impossible target. My hope is that you would believe God for something so impossible. Maybe it's a business that God is laying on your heart to, to start and you think it's just no way it's going to happen get your hopes up believe God for the impossible I want you to believe God in the same way it's almost like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute I want you to have that kind of faith I want you to believe God for that before me and Crystal launched this church whenever we were just kind of talking about it and kind of sharing the vision um, to different people I remember we encountered this one couple that we we you know they had actually heard that we were going to launch a church and and they 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 just told us they said um yeah we we tried that and failed. Good luck. And I was like, I don't need luck. I got God. I'm just saying. And I mean, when God is before you, what can come against you? So get your hopes up, everybody. Believe God for the impossible. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, exceedingly, abundantly, above all, that we ask or think according to his power that is working inside of us. I'm declaring today, this church, we're going to get our hopes up. We're going to have big faith. Believe God for impossible things that are exceedingly, abundantly, far, than any, far greater than anything we ask or anything that we seek in Jesus' name. So I want to close with this, this last um, story in Mark 8 and 22. And it said this, so Jesus and his disciples are together, and it said they came to Beth, a place called Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man. So these, these, these friends had a, had a blind friend, so the, so the friends brought their blind friend to see Jesus. Now, I understand that this guy is literally blind in this story. This is, this is a true story about a blind man where his friends brought him to see Jesus, but I believe that the Bible also 
gives us these stories because it's spiritual insight for our lives and our situations that we face. And so some of you are here today and you feel that way. Like you may not be physically blind, but you're spiritually blind. Like you, you, you feel like your faith is dead and it's, and it's just kind of non-existent and you can't see. You have no passion, excitement, energy, or desire. Like you just feel dead in your faith. And then well, here's what they did. The blind friends begged Jesus to touch him, right? They said, Jesus, would you, would you touch him? Now, they probably literally meant, would you just put your hands on him and do, do, do that hand thing, that healing thing that we've seen you do? Because we've seen you do that, and you're really great at that. So would you, would you do that? We brought our friend here. We convinced them that, yes, you can heal him. Now he's here. Now would you just go ahead and do that? And, and, and Jesus took the blind man by the hand, and he led him outside the village. Everybody say, outside the village. Some of you need to get outside the village. Some of you need to get outside of your comfort zone, out of the place of all the distractions, all the chaos, all the naysayers, and get into a place and get into the presence of God and build that relationship with Him. Some of you are, are so out of touch with your, with your relationship with Him, you don't, you don't have a relationship with Him anymore. You're not talking to Him anymore. Now, God still loves you, but you can't have a seemingly impossible culture-defying a heavenly impactful dream if you don't get connected with the heart of God and get into the presence of God and some of you just got to get outside the village so to speak and get into a place with him and get connected with him again and so Jesus takes the blind guy with his blind friends not the, they're not blind but the blind guy's friends are there and it says that when he had spit on the man's eyes. Like the dudes brought their blind friend to Jesus, trusting him to put it their, his hands on the guy. And what does Jesus do? He spits on their friend. I could just picture the, 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 dude, the, the blind friend's guys going, oh, oh, no, Jesus, not that, no. What do you do that for? Like, Jesus will oftentimes, like almost every time, do things differently than what you expect. Like when you go to God in faith and you get your hopes up and you're believing God's going to answer this prayer, like get ready because more than likely God's not going to answer it the way that you thought he should have answered it. God doesn't do things the way that you think he should do it. But if you don't like the mess, then you probably ain't okay with the miracle either. Like you got to be okay with the mess to get the miracle. And Jesus spits on the guy's eyes. And then, then Jesus puts his hands on him. And Jesus asked, okay, do you see anything? And the blind guy looked up. And he said, I, I see people, but it's not clear. Like, there's no clarity. He said, they look like trees walking around. Well, I think a great question to ask is, how did he, he's blind. Like, how does he know what trees look like? It's because there was a point in his life whenever he once could see, but he lost his sight. And some of you feel that today. That there was a time where God touched your life, you were running the race, like you had your eyes focused on, like you were trusting God, and now it's like something happened, life got in the way, or whatever it is, and you're spiritually blind. And, and you have some sight, like you can kind of make out things, in your faith but it's like not clear to you so these next two words are powerful where it says once again and I'm, I'm telling you today like some of you have had a touch from God like you've experienced the goodness of God and you need to know that God is a God of once again like hey, he may have did it then he may, have, he may have changed your finances then. He may have came through then. He may have healed you then. Well, guess what? God is a God of once again. He did it then. He'll do it again. And I'm declaring today that you would get your hopes up and you would believe that. And so Jesus puts his hands on the man's eyes. And then his eyes were open and his sight was now restored. And here is my whole message for you right here. And he saw everything clearly that's my hope for you that you would see your life 
that you would see your marriage, you would see your city, your future clearly through the eyes of God. That you'd let the Holy Spirit in to do a powerful work in you. He give you a target for your faith and he'll give you something to run to and your faith will come alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer team, can you come, come down to the front? And I want to invite you to just bow your heads today and I want to pray over you today. And Let's make a real decision for Jesus today. God, I pray for every person here today. Maybe they're spiritually dead or maybe you've given them a vision and, and they just kind of lost hope in that, Father. I pray that once again, God, you'd stir their heart. God, you would remind them today that you are good and you love them and you care about them. And God, we believe again. God, I pray that our faith would be the most exciting part of our life. Stir us, God. God, we just open ourselves to you. We are tender and pliable, God. We, de we delight ourselves in you, Lord, for you are good and we trust you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to invite you to him. Just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. It's the most powerful thing you can say. It's the strongest thing you can say. I surrender it all to you. I surrender my finances, my life, my health, my addictions. I give it all to you, God, my family. I surrender everything to you, Jesus. Thank you for giving your life on the cross for me. And you went to the grave and you were resurrected to a new life, the life you desire me to have. And I receive that today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, can we stand to our feet today? And can you give God a hand clap of praise for those that received Jesus today? Now, if you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, these altars are open for you. We want to pray over you today. And we're going to worship for just a moment longer. If you made a decision in your faith, then take that connection card out. Let us know. Drop it in the offering box. We'd love to send you a, a next step letter letting you know if you're a guest with us. We'd love to see you at Guest Central on your way out. We have a gift for you. I want to pray over you one more time. Jesus, thank you for today, God. Thank you that you are a God of the impossible. God, you say that we have faith the size of a mustard seed. You can, we can move mountains in Jesus' name. So today, God, we declare mountains being moved. God, we declare the impossible being done. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.